Thanks for the nice introduction, Susanna. And, um, okay. A scholar of the Guggenheim Foundation, Elio Chisica moves in 1971 to New York City. Some months earlier, he successfully participated there with his installation Niños at a group exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. Arrived in New York, he transforms his apartment into the spacious artwork Babylonest, consequently comparing and dissociating himself from Kurt Schwitters and his Merzbau, a likewise spacious artwork from the early 30s. Schwitters built in the studio of his house in Hanover an environmental collage made of different objets trouvés. As time passed, they occupied the whole space. With the continuous growth, the original architecture successfully, successively disappeared. This constellation is the initial point of my presentation, which stems from my master's thesis that will be completed during the next months or weeks, let's see. <laughs> my, my paper deals with the influence Kurt Schwitters had on the spatial oeuvre of Elio Ochisika. I'm particularly interested in how and to what extent could Ochisika receive the oeuvre of Schwitters and which documents were therefore placed at his disposal. The leap in time and space in Ochisika's references to Schwitters' stage is all in all remarkable. After all, he refers not only to an occasion that took place 40 years ago, but also includes three countries on three continents and combines different art movements. How and in which way does Schwitters, who has already died in 1948, arrive from Hanover via Rio to New York? Which options are at Ochisika's command, who alludes in the late 1950s in Brazil to an artist that all his life has never left Europe? Unlike the previous speaker, Lena, who showed in her analysis a single series of photographs and its appearance within Brazil, I will focus on how documents are able to travel and what kind of value emerges from them, primarily for artists but also for art historians. What is the significance and impact of the document that, re that represents an artwork? And what happens to the document once it breaks an historical and cultural frame? The case of Schwitters and Ochisika is very special, since both artworks do not exist anymore, apart from the partial reconstruction of the Merzbaum. Given that artworks may be impermanent or non-existent, the question comes up of how art historians can get access to these historical sources, even if they are unattainable. Not only written or visual documents, such as photographs or duplicates, must be considered as substitutes, but also oral history and individual witnesses may serve as fundamental historical sources. Just as the material I'm referring to, my lecture wants to reconstruct a chronological journey and seeks to span a range beginning in the year 1957 when Arolo de Campos, a poet, art critic and good friend of Elio Chisica, published the article Kurt Schwitters or the Joy of the Object. For the first time herein, Schwitters' poem An Anna Blume, as well as parts of the Ursonate, are translated into Portuguese. Additionally, de Campos deals with Schwitters' poetics of his lyric and plastic oeuvre. According to him, Schwitters was able to provide material which was, I quote, ostracized by the defenders of good taste with poetry and an art artistic value. In doing so, Schwitters did not act arbitrarily, but made the material selection and formal decisions due to his precise understanding of textures, colors, formal correlation, as well as of tactile and optical values. <coughs> I'm mentioning this is essay at this point since it was the first art theoretical examination of Schwitter's oeuvre ever in Brazil, and was published even before his first South American exhibition in the year 1961, when he participated posthumously at the Biennale of Sao Paulo. In fact, we can see herein a rediscovery of Schwitters, who at this point had almost passed out of mind. But certainly in the complex artistic context of the 1950s in Brazil, he could gain in greater importance. Knowing about the prominent role that Arolo de Campos played in the progress of Brazilian neoconcretismo, as well as the early friendship he shared with Ochisica, 
We have to assume that Olchisika addressed the recension that Arolo de Campos wrote on Schwitters well before Schwitters was exhibited at the Biennale. Also, we should not forget the importance and impact of the influential art critic Ferreira Goulart. In the late 1950s, he starts reflecting on Schwitters. In his highly respected essay, Theory of the Non-Object, he describes the progression of figurative painting towards abstract art in modernity. As a consequence thereof, the artwork took on greater significance as an object itself, followed by the elim elimination of the object by artists like Mondrian or Malevich. Unlike then these two artists, Schwitters was able to, I quote Ferreira Goulart, substitute fiction for reality. Since he was already exempted from the frame in his Merzbau, a frame that Mondrian was still struggling with, and could work at the actual and real side, the artwork of the object at Schwitters were blending then. Unsurprisingly, yeah, these are the uh, like original photographs of the Merzbau. Unsurprisingly, Goulart conceived the Merzbau in his text in unique status. After all, he's particularly fascinated by the fact how Schwitters intertwines the artwork with reality due to the experience the Merzbau provides. At that, he directs his attention to the temporality Schwitters is confronted with. I quote him, his Merzbau does not express anything else than the impossibility to complete the artwork because the reality it wants to express is incomplete, end of quote. Both examples show the value of written examination of Schwitters' oeuvre in Brazil and both his art historical integration as well as his impact on the artistic context on the era. The confrontation of the neoconcretistas neo neo with European and Russian concrete art of the 1920s and 30s and their intertwinement with artists like Mondrian, Malevich, or Max Bill is widely investigated. And yet the importance of Schwitters has always been ignored. To come closer to Schwitters' influence in the 50s and 60s in Brazil, we have to review his posthumous participation 13 years after he has passed away at the 6th Biennale of São Paulo. Curated by the art critic Mario Pedrosa, it was by then the biggest non-European retrospective of Schwitters. The exhibition in such a great extent must be read necessarily in the historical context. São Paulo's Biennale shows clearly the history of reception of European concrete art in Brazil by then, and illustrates its influence on the still-to-be-established neoconcretistas. The subsequent aesthetical and cultural formation of Brazil was by no means a European or North American artistic conversion, and much less an artistic colonialization. Instead, it was a matter of artistic exchange between the Northern and Southern Hemisphere to enable the experience of art. Ligia Clark com comments on this transition. I quote her. It is obvious that the first Biennale of São Paulo in the year 1951 and the awarding of Max Bill provided a transfer of information. There was an exchange. End of quote. Ludwig Grote curated all four German contributions to São Paulo's Biennale until 1951. Yesterday we could get to know him better thanks to Cezanne Neubauer. In 1961, the younger Werner Schmalenbach, who did not only establish thereby a new generation, but also a new curatorial praxis, replaced him. The German-Swiss art historian showed 89 originals of Schwitters. Furthermore, he presented two photographs of the Merzbau in Hannover, which already had been destroyed in 1943. As part of the Biennale participation, Schmalenbach also published an artist catalog of Kurt Schwitters. So there was always a, like a catalog published with all the, all the artists included, but he published a special catalog, just in Schwitters. In it, the Merzbau was mentioned, even though in a shortened and compact manner, I quote the catalog. The famous Merzbau, in which he transformed his studio and apartment in Hannover. It was a fantastic labyrinth, built of wood and plaster, decorated with sculptures and graves in the style of Dadaism. End of quote. Thus, any reference to the Merzbau followed by Oichisika results from these two written reviews and the Biennale exhibition. 
Both of the black and white photographs shown there took the responsibility to transport the Matzbau in all his size and extent and to put it in a different context. As a representative of an architectonic and large construction, both documents are able to portray their aesthetics and the attention to detail. I want to quote Roland Barthes, who says, the photograph's essence is to ratify what it represents. Ultimately, Schmalbach's essay serves as a theoretical basis for the understanding of the construction. This leads to the fact that the spirit of a sculptural labyrinth may arise from a two-dimensional and restrained photograph. The photographic document succeeds in sending a non-transportable creation on a journey, or even more. It resurrects an artwork that has been already dead for half a century and makes it experienceable again. I want to refer to Roland Barthes, again, who, un who unfolds this ability. He says, the punctum is legible in historical photographs. There is always a defeat of time in them that is dead and that is going to die, all under the instance of reality. The photographs allow us to move back through time. We might start from the assumption that Ojisika experienced Schwitter's overcoming of time examining his works at the Biennale. He dedicated himself intensely to this topic, to the point that he, one year later, wrote a small essay in which he addresses Schwitter's confrontation with the sublime. He says, the deep desire for construction which appears in Schwitter's works is the consequence of conceiving the world intuitively as an ideal and non-immediate habitat. Besides, he built his Merzbilder of elements of just this habitat, according to the German term Welt, marvelous constructions due to the exemplary austerity and due to their highly dramatic sense. In truth, Schwitters wants to raise the immediate up to the non-immediate and to the sublime. At this point, I briefly want to shed light on Ochisika's aesthetic and theoretical development to make his work Babylonesque more comprehensible and accessible. Without an observation of his artistic beginnings, it is impossible to understand his late work. At the time when Ochisika got to know Schwitters better and gained access to his work, his, oeuvre, his own oeuvre already had started to overcome the two-dimensional borders of his early meta schemas. The three-dimensional Helevos Espaciales and Nucleus left the linearity of the previous works behind and gained depth. They require a circular orbit whereby a new space arises, above, below, inside, outside, and also an in-between. In contrast to the Merzbau, all these objects still take place in a sterile exhibition space, mainly a white cube, where they are at risk to fail in their perceptibility. The penetraves, which emerged in the early 1960s, mark a clear cut. None other of Ochisika's work is by then that specialized. The cabins, made of wood, colorful fabrics, and painted sheets, are openable and they can be walked on. One can move the flexible doors and curtains. In case the penetrave does not consist only of one room, it is possible to enter and penetrate into the following booth. As a consequence, the spectator becomes an explorer of the work by uncovering part by part and section by section. This very explorer penetrates a labyrinth. He sees, listens, and feels everything spontaneously at the moment. The visual impressions become now vivencias. This is the term Ochisika always used, which can be translated like lived experience. And real space becomes aesthetic space and gains in magic and super sensuousness. Ochisika created therefore the word suprasensorial. These terms allude to the way in which the spectator is enabled now with a total perception. He may extend his habitual capability and achievements to finally reach his creative and impulsive insight. Ochisika perfect, perfects the labyrinth as an aesthetic realm of experience and ascribes it with the possibility of direct participation. The creation of the Parangolés at about the same time is evident. 
None of Ochisika's previous or following artworks holds such a domin dominant corporeality and induces such an experiencing of color. By all means, we absolutely have to attribute a singular importance to the Padangoles. It is not enough to touch the mostly textile cape or to view it from different sides. At the attempt to define the parangolé, Ochisika refers directly to Kurzwitters. This comparison is remarca remarkably interesting since he adapts Schwitter's methods to his own. Let's remember that one and a half years ago he still focused on Schwitter's constructive approach, whereas now he directs his attention to the experimental character of Schwitter's and his own work. He says, Parangolet assumes the same character as for Schwitters, for example, assumed Merz and his der derivations, Merzbau, etc. For him, they were the defini definition of a specific experimental position, fundamental to the theoretical and experimental understanding of his whole oeuvre. Experiencing has now priority, and as a consequence thereof, it is dissociated from the white cube. The Parangolaire works as an allegory of anti-art and shall provoke a supersensible transformation for the dancing participator. It creates an open and adventurous space. Ochisika brings attention to this approach with his dictum, the museum is the world, it is the everyday experience. Life and art begin to merge in the sense of cre leisure he believed that artistic progress and creativity might result only from leisure. So the term can be read in many, many options. We heard about that yesterday. He also reformed his position as an artist and from now on did not want to exhibit in the context of a museum or gallery anymore. So after that, he had three more exhibitions in the MoMA in, seven, in 1970 and in the University of Sussex and in London, but all were very different than the earlier exhibitions. Life, openness, experiment, spontaneity. These are Ochisika's paradigms by the end of the 1960s. What matters, what matters now is natural and organic movement stretched to an architectonic and experimental space. In 1971, Ochisika finally moves to New York City, where he creates Babylon Nest, a spatial construction made of six nests that he calls Ninos, which he divided in three sections and two levels. In the end, Babylon Nest occupied his whole 75 square meters apartment. Consisting of wood, various clothes, and fabrics, Babylon Nest was sort of a habitation. One could sleep on mattresses, stick paper to the wall, read books, or just relax. Nylon blankets separate the nests. Not only wooden fabrics, but also paper, plastic, and textile found their way and were integrated. Babylonesque was not, not placed only as a visual installation to the loft. It definitely wanted to be used and explored. The special entity is more than just another artwork of, in Ochisika's oeuvre. All his previous uh, efforts to overcome space in order that human body can connect with it were now realized. The always proclaimed supersensuousness is now possible. Experiencing a vivencia and cre leisure was never admitted like that before in any previous work, but yet they were desperately necessary to achieve this long awaited condition. Babylonest only makes the proposal for living and experiencing. Um, Ochisika said, the loft here is great. I built six nests to live in. It is understandably enough to impulsively compare Ochisika's Babylon nest with Schwitter's Merzbau, since he was very enthusiastic about his constructive and dramatic mind. Due to Ochisika, it was Schwitter's who discovered the open construction derived from the process of collage. Openness that allows organic growth and that connects to the space was crucial for Ochisika's development. Both Babylonest as well as Merzbau claim to have the organic character of a city, which is on the one hand self-contained and extreme private, and on the other hand opens up. Both hold an existential naturalness and grow almost organically and continuously. 
Schwitters and Oichi Sika insist on the fact that their works do neither have a defined nor a formal end. Both artworks want yet need to be used and connect art with life. They take place in the intimate setting of an apartment or domicile. Oichi Sika describes, I quote him, to occupy a territory involves more than just being in it. It means to grow with it and to attach importance to the eggshell. We have to ask if Babylonesque, despite its significant differences on the level of aesthetics and construction, is a mere con continuation and arousing variety of the Merzbau, or does it show a clear discrepancy in dealing with the space and object? Answering this question issues a big challenge. When comparing these two artworks, we after all have to rely on the few documents that are still available. Both spatial structures do not exist anymore as an entity. The Merzba was destroyed during a bomb attack in 1943, and Babylonesque was removed when Oichisika moved out of his loft in 1974. Schwitter's Merzba left three wide-angle shots and nine photographic close-ups. All of them were taken on the ground floor of the structure that extended over several levels and may therefore only be considered as fragments. In the case of Babylonesque, there exist about 10 black and white and color photographs and short film sequences. Yesterday we had the chance to see one, some. In which way and to what extent is a profound art historical classification and analysis even possible? At first glance, the photographs show the material differences and the distinct importance of the object itself, of the two artworks. Indeed, both artists create a conglomeration of objets trouvés and everyday material. However, Schwitter's creation seems to be much more constructed thanks to its strict shape of form. An entire fusion of space and artwork indeed succeeded, though the spectator is only able to act and reflect from a distance due to the installation's dominant objectness. We explicitly must also pay great attention to the anecdotes from witnesses who, com who commented on both artworks and who may serve as important sources through oral history. As to Schwitter's Merzba, about, about five statements are recorded, or Chisika's Babylonesque barely offers more. Matters are complicated further by the fact that both works emerged not in publicity, but in their private retreats where they existed only for a relatively short time. Just a selected circle of friends and colleagues gained access to the spatial structures. Happily, both artists were enthusiastic documentalists of their own work. Both the Kurt archive in Hanover and the complete digitalized archive of Elio Echisika offer written concepts, ideas, theorems, and essays by the artists about their own oeuvre to academic research. So it is thanks to Ochisika himself that he resists our temptation to derivate Babylonesque completely from the Merzbau. He says, Schwitters discovered the open construction, derived from the process of collage, Duchamp's ready-mades and Gaudi's architecture. But the arising artwork was still the end of growth or its stagnation. Schwitter's proposal is the proposal of a privileged context or privileged spatial work in which the artist pieces together his found fragments. Here and today, the creation of space may be the opposite of what Schwitters proposes. The lived experience or the significance of space won't be privileged or regulated, but it shall be opened for its construction through participation, participating experience. Indeed, he, refer, he, for, he refers to Schwitters, but, un, but unmistakably relativizes this connection. Ochisika certainly makes use of Schwitters' dadaistic constructive program by occupying the common habitat in a playful way. He improvises with the present material and the relation of the objects among themselves. However, the spatial examination differs in that the space opens up only through participation and the resultant life experience. Schwitters, on the contrary, wants to aestheticize the world through a fragmentation of the single object. Ochisika's concept is a lot more collective. He, as the artist, only makes a proposal. The execution, though, is accomplished by all involved at the moment of creleisure. While Schwitters still imagines the artwork habitat, the casa obra, 
or Chisika already realizes the, the total habitat, the Casa Total. The documents of Schwitters, which were available for Ichisika, accomplished a tremendous leap in time, but also a leap in cultural context. The material was not adopted blindly by Ichisika or his literary colleagues, but placed in a new context. Ichisika answers the question how to deal with this material and documents in the context of the neo-concrete and especially of the tropical movement, as defined by Oswaldo, Oswaldo Giandragi in Anthropophagia. I quote, the devouring of the other should no longer be a characteristic of a lower level of cultural development, but made fertile as a creative principle. In respect of Brazil's dissociation of Europe and the simultaneous generation of its own culture and national identity, this means that the cultural influences of, Europe's, of Europe neither should be carelessly assim assimilated nor completely rejected. Relevant cultural and social influences should be swallowed, digested, and excreted by Brazil, but always involving local conditions to reevaluate the existing mind patterns. Thank you. <laughs>